The Indians once told me stones are the most revered and ancient of recording devices. Having seen and witnessed all since the beginning of time, perhaps I'm here on this earth to write of these mute histories, just another stone, an Oliver Stone. I am honored more than I ever thought. I started here on Hollywood Boulevard in the hotel, the Montecito Hotel is where I first lived when I moved to Hollywood, and I didn't know what was going to happen. And uh, I think like all people who come to this town, I was filled with dreams. And I was very lucky that so many of my dreams did come true. And I have Hollywood to thank for that. Thank you. Would you follow the trace of your father? Would you like to be on the production? I can never be or my father. on the director? I can never be in the same footsteps as my father, but we are most alone when we are with the myths. As I reached 19 on the set of Alexander, I turned to the pages of A Child's Night Dream, the novel that my father had begun when he was 19. The alienation started the day they stole me from the womb in Paris. I remember the long swim, acidic passageways. It was dark, my sperm tail wiggling. I was a nervous baby and thus never was the center of things. Do you think that my father's struggle often in his life has been to balance these two qualities of his mother, who was always more of an extrovert in society? He liked that. And his father who was always more of an introvert. In this giant artist's studio on this hot drinking night full of fame and the matching music, fruging bosoms, painters and movie stars, and plebeians in the street passing and pointing and looking up with disappointment at the giant picture windows. Silhouettes of souls who never worked a day in their lives. Why is it so that we work and they play and yet we marvel at the wetness of fame. I encourage him more to do what he liked, writing. It was this great thing. You know, writing, his father used to say bullshit and everything. I've spent a fortune on you. You realize that? His father wanted him to go to be a banker, you know. So. How badly I wanted to go to Yale the ridiculously fragile things upon which we construct the fabric of our lives. Who am I in my little college room going home and saying, Father, you're wrong. Eliot's poem is structured on the belief that as each 8.30 morning, two million workers pour into Wall Street to give their souls, even Father, who makes five times more than the average man, says he's poor. What does war do to the soul? You see, Dad, I must leave this country, which I hate, but I also love. That is why, don't you understand, I am leaving to learn why we are what we are. All this money, all this time, with the market going the way it is. All I heard were the words, you're nuts. And I shouted at the befuddled figure almost thrice my age. I'd like to kill you. You're such a, such a, such a. You don't even answer me. You still got that stupid look in your face. Poetry, fire, flu, I go. Smash the barriers, fight off the bloody scholars. They read and they read, they read until their eyes go blue, and yet they never understand. Sad scholars who see not the sunset at sea, the fast fading margin of experience, the nature that is one with Ulysses who dared strive with the gods. Did you feel like Vietnam changed him in any way? Oh, hello. standing in the rain in my poncho, looking at the puddles, sad, leaden emotions, and thinking no more of nothing. I thought abstractly of life and death, of the freak accidents which distinguish the two, of myself as an individual, as one body of boy, yearning, basically noble, and yet insignificant. The East has a way of 
swallowing men and their dreams. Did you feel like Vietnam changed him? He was not relating to people. He was very criticizing of the world. Uh, and uh, mostly of us. Yes, parents? Yeah. You get discouraged. When you're cut off from society, when you don't have the education that they want, you are cut off to a certain degree. You're no longer the prime candidates. That was pretty scary to be alone. I went out and, you know, I got jobs first in real life. And I think it's a little dangerous to go through film school only. And, you know, what is your reference? You have to have a life also. You have to have a life experience to base, base your films on. I quit. <laughs> it took an apartment, he painted it. All red. Red, red, red. This is the Pepsi-Cola sanctioned ride through the world. This is what you're supposed to see. Birth, death, paying taxes, working, having wife, child, being good man, morality, blah, blah, blah. Pay your taxes, pay the military, drop bombs, kill people, wipe out governments, and then pay your taxes and you die again. What kind of life is that? Because that's where the battle is between despair and hope. <laughs> and that's sort of where it's gonna be the rest of your life. Yeah. And if you're a man, you're gonna take it. You're not gonna run away from it and take drugs and kill yourself, become James Dean. You gotta fucking face it. Did you ever read A Child's Night Dream? Yes, I did. I don't agree with the book. I will not say it. Why? Make me wicked. Goodbye, mother. Goodbye. Forgive, forget, forgot, and on and on and on. Cry, cry this naked land for the everlasting contradictions of its kaleidoscopic conflict. Thou art my goddess. Anyone can look back at their life and see how one event leads to another. And had you never gone to Vietnam, who knows what would have happened to you? Or even if, let's say, Platoon hadn't broken the way it did, what would have happened to you as a director? I guess what I'm trying to say is, had you never been a filmmaker, what could you have envisioned yourself doing? Thirty years have passed, but this I know. This boy Oliver wanted, no, needed, desperately to be heard and loved. I hope with this book to be that friend he so needed. What was it like growing up with Oliver's album? What was it like? Tell us a little bit. It was cool. Was it? It was a good experience. He's a cool dad, man. You know, when I knew I was getting older, so I walked in with a spectacle and the girls would only look at me once. In the old days, they looked back, back. they at least looked back. <laughs> Why did you slow down your pace after you turned? Well, I felt I'd worked for those 12 years and delivered a body of work, which is what I'd always wanted to do. Do you ever go back and watch your films? It was always very difficult for me to watch them because I would have to face the flaws. After time, though, it was easier because you accept yourself more. Oh, mackerel, man. that is football! I did have some health problems from stress and some financial setbacks on Nixon and other films. My life has been ruined by some of the things I put on screen. People think horrible things about me. But this is only in this life. Excuse me, being like a for-profit panderer, a murderer type on National Born Killers and JFK to lie to the American public to purposely distort children's minds. What a, that's, that's a heavy accusation, uh, and it's, it stinks, you know, and it's a very dangerous thing, and I, I, it's happened to me, I've been smeared by many people repeatedly. Which tells me I must be doing something right. <laughs>